our time of worship. Take your Bibles this morning and turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. I actually, <clears throat> in my intentions when I began the week of preparation uh, to preach, I actually wrote uh, over two-thirds of the message on Galatians. So I got a head start. If I ever do go back to Galatians 3, I got a pretty good start on the message. But uh, this last Wednesday night, you know, we have our Zoom Bible study every Wednesday night. And I've been thinking about the kingdom parables, particularly this parable of sower's seed. I've had it on my mind for probably two or three weeks and kind of been rolling it over and been taking a few notes and been studying a few different commentaries on it and just been spending a lot of time reading Matthew 13 and uh, con, you know paralleling it over with Luke chapter 8 and wanted to preach on it but just hadn't really felt led. And in our Zoom Bible study the other night, as we started in First Thessalonians, uh, one particular verse that just, just just really reached out and gripped me, and Bill made a couple of comments on it. And I, after we got done that night, I went to bed thinking about, because of what was said in that particular verse that we read, it drew me back to this in Matthew 13. And so I got up Thursday morning and started working on a message on Matthew 13, Started about 9.30 Thursday morning, and by about 9 o'clock, I didn't, I don't think I worked 24 hours, but the next morning, by about 9.30 in the morning, I was done with what I'm going to print, present to you this morning. But that verse was this, For our gospel came not unto you in word only. You hear that? It came not to you in word only, but also in power. And that word power is the same word that's translated power over in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, the dunamis, the dynamite of God unto salvation to every man that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein and in the gospel, that power is revealed the most important power of all. What? The righteousness of God revealed from faith, from this written word, to faith, the God-given faith. As it's written, the justified, the righteous, the one made righteous by their oneness with Christ. The just live by faith. But I just couldn't get that out of my mind. Word only. Word only. Bill made this statement. He said that that verse is an excellent presentation of both the general call of the gospel because everybody hears the gospel. You know, I mean, you're, if you're, even if you're an unbeliever this morning, you're going to hear every word that I've said. So the gospel is going forward. But it also reveals the effectual call of the gospel. My sheep hear my voice, and they come to me, and I give unto them eternal life. So the same gospel that goes forth that's a saber of death unto death to you, if you, if you happen to be a reprobate, you sit here and die in unbelief and you refuse to rest in Christ as the Lord you're right, that same gospel that you've heard with your ear, it's the power of God unto salvation to all God's elect. Same message. Same gospel. And see, here's the thing. Having been deceived myself, and that's one good thing. I can speak from experience. Being deceived myself and entrenched by false religion for many years and knowing when I was entrenched in false religion and deceived by false religion, knowing what I thought in my lost state of my profession of faith, and I did make a profession of faith, and I had an experience. I wept, you know, I wrote down all my sins and I wept over my sin because I thought that's what I was supposed to do. You know, I just this verse and this parable that we're going to look at moved me to preach this message concerning true faith and true repentance, as opposed to a false profession of religion made by many under various circumstances. Most of them conscience conviction. You get caught doing something you shouldn't do. And you want to make it right. You want to amend. Mean? That's what most people's professions of religions about. They feel bad about something they have done or have not done. 
and they want to make amends for it. That's not salvation. It's just not. Look at verses 1 through 3 here in Matthew chapter 13. It says, In the same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. This didn't happen by accident. If you go back, he had spent the previous day preaching the gospel, traveling. I, it wasn't like me getting in my car over in Wedgwood and driving over here. He, he walked great distances to preach the gospel and labored in preaching the gospel and dealt with men and women's situation and problems. But yet the next day, what does he do? The same day he went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside and great multitudes gathered together unto him so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude, a multitude means a bunch. Huh? That's what it means, a lot of folks. they standing on the seashore, on the shore, shore of the sea. And notice verse 3, And he spake many things unto them in parables. Spake many things unto them in parables. And here's the thing that I got this week in studying for this. Here's our Lord, and here's this great multitude of folks that's come out to hear him. So much so that he, in order for them to be able to see him, he gets on a boat there on the shore where he can speak. I, yeah, it, it must have been amazing to hear our Lord speak. I mean, it, we're talking about the eternal word of God speaking. And yet, here's this great multitude of people and the only way he speaks to these multitudes that are sitting there listening to him speaks to them in parables. Matter of fact, eight parables. Count them for yourself, Matthew chapter 13. Eight parables. They're called the kingdom parables. Verse 34 of this same chapter says this, All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. And without a parable, spake he not unto them. In other words, everything our Lord said to this vast multitude of men and women that have come out there to hear him, Kenny, it's always in a parable. What, what's a parable? Well, a, a parable, simply put, the definition of it is, according to Strong, it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Basically, it was a parable that our Lord spoke to Nicodemus. Yeah. And Nicodemus got hung up on the earthly part of it. And so our Lord is speaking earthly stories to teach heavenly principles. And it brought this question to my mind. I, 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 and I, this is not in my notes, but I tell you what. The Lord Jesus Christ would have flunked out of Lynchburg, Virginia, and Jerry Falwell's school of evangel evangelism. <laughs> he wouldn't have been evangelic enough. But this is the question that popped into my mind when I read that, that he, he spoke to this multitude in parables, and he didn't speak to them any other way than parables. It's a sweet little love and Jesus. This is the one that you see everybody in the football field with John 3.16 under their eyelids or John 3.16 behind the goal post, you know, or the, go to the, the, the camera after the game. I, I thank the Lord for giving me the ability to run the ball or throw the ball or tackle the ball or do this or that or another. I want to give God all the glory. Nothing about Christ, nothing about right. That, that ain't how we witness. That's practicing your religion before men. But here's the thing, if Christ's desire, the Lord Jesus Christ, his desire and his design was for all men and women without exception to be saved, if they had believed and accept him as their personal Lord and Savior, why speak in parables? And not speak any other way. Why not speak with great plainness of speech and openness? And in simple language, why not do that? Why not talk like they talked to me as a child? Will you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Why didn't he use that kind of language? Won't you come to me and let me save you? Why, why, wouldn't that be a lot easier? If, if that's his goal, to just get them in the kingdom, why not speak that way? 
You know, even Christ's disciples, both here and over in Luke, they ask the same question. Why speak to them? Why do you speak to them in parables? They were perplexed. And I tell, our Lord Jesus Christ, he did not hesitate to give them an answer. He answered and said to them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them... Now, there's a multitude, but to them, it is not given. Let the words of the Lord Jesus Christ sink into your mind with this evangelistic world that we live in. It's given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them, it's not given. We'll see as we study this first parable of the sower and the seed. Thankfully, our Lord Jesus Christ, he interpreted and explained the meaning of this parable to his disciples. Matter of fact, he told them why they could hear. And he told them why they understood. Listen to our Lord's word. Blessed are your eyes, for they see. And your ears, for they hear. Now, isn't that the case with all God's elect in every generation? Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Listen to our Lord again. It's written in the prophets, Jeremiah. And they shall be all taught of God. How many of them? They shall be all taught taught of God all who all God's elect all those chosen and given by the father to the son in everlasting covenant of grace all those that Christ the son by his very obedience unto death his bloody sacrifice redeemed and justified from all their sin they 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 shall all be taught of God and all those that are taught of God every man therefore that's taught of God that hath heard Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and hath learned, for your ears hear, of the Father. What? That he will by no means clear the guilty. You learned that? That he will not accept you based on your best obedience. Matter of fact, he cannot accept you based on your best obedience. Matter of fact, if God entered into judgment with you or me for what we've done in these few moments of worship together this morning, if He entered into judgment with us based on it, He would damn all of us. Heard of that, Father? What do you do? You come to me. Why? He's our surety. He's our substitute. He's the Lord our righteousness. That's why we flee to Him. Our Lord said on another occasion, He that is of God, hears God's word. You therefore hear them not. For you're not of God. And that of God means to be born of God. He that's of God, born of God, regenerated, converted by God, justified by God, sanctified by God, glorified by God. That's to be of God. We hear His word. We don't debate and argue about it, worry about it, concern ourselves about it. We just trust Him, believe Him, ask Him for wisdom and guidance in it. So then faith, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10, verse 7, comes by how? By hearing. By, by going into this audible ear. And hearing, this ability to be able to discern these spiritual truth is by the Word of God. By the logos of God, the eternal word of God. Now let's read this parable of the sower and the seed. And, and then we'll look at Christ's interpretation. Look at verse 3 through 9. It's an interesting parable. I mean, it, it really is. He said in them, uh, excuse me, that's wrong, wrong page. Verse 3, the end of verse 3. Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprang up because they had no deepness of earth. 
And when the sun was up, they were scorched because they had no root. They withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them, and other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And I tell you, I can remember in my lost estate. I did preach on this one time when I was lost. You know where all the emphasis was on? Verse 8. The end of it. The fruit. I can remember making this stupid statement. There were everybody, there were a hundredfold fruit, sixtyfold fruit, thirtyfold fruit, but there's no, no fruit. <laughs> and my point was, I can remember the point. <laughs> You don't produce no fruit, you don't know God. But we would never define the fruit. The fruit was suspect. It was mysticism's what it was. All of it. In its entirety. And I tell you, if you'll keep in mind what I'm going to try to show you this morning, and what I'm about to tell you, particularly about these kingdom parables, it'll make all of these kingdom parables, all of Christ's words here, a whole lot easier to understand. With these king, each of these kingdom par, uh, parables... The kingdom of heaven, and when you see it, because he keeps talking about it, not just here, but every one of them, all eight of them, talks about the kingdom of heaven. The, the kingdom of heaven, what is it? It, it? It's a reference to the visible church, the, the, the visible church, as it exists in this present world, as well as establishing the eternal destiny of all those Christ redeemed by his obedience unto death. And what you have to keep in mind is this. In this kingdom of heaven, that is to say, in the visible church, even God's true church in this present world, there exist in his true church all four of these kinds of heroes. Some of these folks ain't Catholics, and some of them Seventh-day Adventists, and then some of them down at the Grace Church. We're talking about the kingdom of heaven, God's church. His visible church, his those called those his ecclesia, the called out ones, you and me. And in the midst of his church, there's these four types of hearers, all four of them. And all four of the hearers, and you got to get this in your mind. All four of these hearers, they all hear the gospel with their physical ears. All four of them. Three of them, they just hear it with a natural ear. But one, one of the hearers, they've been given the gift of hearing. Now drop down to verse 16. It's here Christ interprets. He tells of these guys, and these are disciples, his true disciples. That, yeah, yeah, it's, he, he, you know, he doesn't offer this explanation to the multitude. I would assume by the fact that he explained it to them, the disciples were on the boat with him. And the multitude still on the shore. And he turns and they asked him, you know, we read a moment ago over in Luke. They said, what's, this, what's the meaning of this parable? Well, he's got them there with him and, and the eternal word teaches them. And he looks at them in verse 16. He said, blessed are your eyes for they see, your ears for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous have desired to see those things which you see. And have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When our Lord looks at these men, these disciples, that he's about to explain this to them, this ain't just, I hope you hear it, hear it. Right? Now one even among these heard it, but it was of no difference because he was the devil from the beginning. But thank God there was 11 of them, our Lord says, you hear it. And they heard it. I guarantee you, later on when they preached it, they remembered this, what our Lord taught them. And see, after this declaration that they would hear and that they would understand the eternal word as he explains the meaning of this parable, Christ tells us that in this kingdom of heaven, in this church of his that exists in time, there are four different hearers. Let's look at all four of them. Here's the first one. Look at verse 20, verse 19. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, 
Then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. You see that? It's sown to him and sown in his heart, in his mind, in his understanding. It's given to him to where he can at least hear it with his physical ear and understand it at least rationally. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. If you connect what Christ says here with a parable he spoke back up in verses 3 through 8, Who's the sower? Who's sowing the seed? The Lord himself. The Lord Jesus Christ. As well as all those he sends forth to sow the seed. Who? These men that he's explaining this to. His apostles. And all those who would hear and believe through the message of these apostles. His evangelists. His pastor teachers. And folks, even you and me as individual saints. We hear these words. The seed sown by him and all that uh, represents him, what's, what's the seed sown? What are we sowing? The gospel. Before our Lord Jesus Christ ascended to glory, he declared the responsibility of you and me as his children. He, Jesus came and spake to them saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Now, since he's got all power and we're in him and we're his, go ye therefore and do what? Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. How long are we to sow this seed? Till you take your last breath. That's your responsibility. We, as God's children, have been given a unique privilege and responsibility. Have we not? We get the unique privilege and responsibility to preach God's gospel indiscriminately to every individual who he, by his providence, brings into our, under our hearing. I, I count it such a joy to be able to stand up every Sunday and I don't, I don't know the condition of everybody's heart in this church. I don't know the condition everybody listens to us. I certainly don't know with as many people that we have listening out there who has heard and who has not. But that's not for me to try to figure out. What's God called us to do? Preach the gospel, be instant in season and out of season. Those who we preach to or share the gospel with, our Lord says of them here, are those that they hear the word of the kingdom. They hear the gospel message. But he says here, they only hear it with what ear? The natural ear. The key here is this. They understandeth it not. They understandeth it not. That word understandeth means to set or bring together. Kind of like putting a puzzle together. You ever tried to put a puzzle together and there'd be one piece missing out of the box? And you, you, you try to put every puzzle piece, you try to put the wrong piece in to fill the hole. You know? <laughs> they, can't, they can't figure out the puzzle. Or the better translation is this, to put as it were the perception with the thing perceived. To put with the perception the thing that's perceived. In other words, they hear the gospel with the physical ear. They take all the information into their physical mind. But because they're still dead in trespasses and sin, they cannot and they will not see the life and death issues of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. But tragically, notice what happens to those who have no understanding. Then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. What happens to them? The wicked one catches away the seed. The question then is this. What does he catch away? Huh? What does he catch away? It can't be the grace of God. Because I tell you this much. If the grace of God is sown in a man or woman's heart, how long is it there for? <laughs> it can't be lost. All that the Father. It's, this is how secure we are about it. If, if a man has received the grace of God, been given the grace of God, had it bestowed upon him. 
Our Lord said this, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh unto me, what? I will in no wise cast out. He said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them. I love them. And they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. And listen to this. They shall never perish. Neither shall any. I mean, he catches away. The devil comes and he catches away the seed. Neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. What the wicked catcheth away is the word of truth from their memory. Takes it away. The wicked one catches away the truth of the gospel from their understanding in such a way that they're not even aware of it. You know, in the past, when I thought about passages like this, I thought that these folks that went away, you know what I thought they always turned into? They, turned, they were like the way of Cain. You know, we, we always make the wrong assumptions. We, we think Cain was this evil, wicked dude. He wasn't. Was he? He was a religious man. He went to sacrifice with God. But he was a murder and thieves what he was, but he still went to sacrifice to God. But I used to assume that these are just, when they go away, I meant that they, I, I used to think they left the church and just, they went and got drunk and slept around on their spouse and became homosexuals and everything ungodly and immoral. You know, that's, it's not the case. Because remember what we're talking about? We're talking about the kingdom of heaven. We're talking about the visible church. Doesn't mean they go out. Where do they stay? They stay. They stay right there inside the visible church. But here's the thing, everything that they do, it, even their worship, being here, sitting in a church, even though the, 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 word, the, the, the truth of the gospel, the freedom and liberty in Christ, the eternal salvation that, that they do not possess, everything that they do, the songs that they sing, the prayers that they pray, the scripture that they read, the morality that they produce, what is it? It's dead works and fruit unto death. It's more ungodly and more offensive to the true and living God than the sins that they're actually seeking to avoid. Go let them tell you that down at another church. Well, not another church, another first false place. They're not going to tell you that. Oh, he's, he or she, they're trying so hard. They're good people. Even though the scripture says there's none good, no, not one. Might be good by my standard, your standard, not good by his standard. It's not by works of righteousness which we've done. You know, these are all here as part of the visible church. So they can and they often do continue in religion, but but everything they do, they do it without an understanding of Christ. This is the Lord there right. And our Lord says that these are those that are like the seed that falls by the wayside. In other words, the true gospel of God's grace has as much effect on these seed, these people, as the seeds that fall by the wayside. And that word wayside means by the beaten path. I remember when Bart used to come out, we were in, back out there in the, in the woods, and he would till up that down there and plant that garden. And it's amazing to me, but the only thing that would grow in the middle was grass. And I don't know, you, you, got the, you got the row, and then you got the valley in between the rows. The only thing that would grow in there is grass. It, it's, you know, cause we walked up and down through it pulling weeds. It's trampled down. Nothing would grow there. Just dead earth. And that's the thing. It, it reminds me, these people remind me of the ones that Solomon described twice. This way, there is a way that seemeth right unto man, and the end of that way is the way of death. So they'll continue in the church. They'll sit there and, they, I mean, I, the best thing that could be is that they continue to sit there if the Lord would be merciful to them. But here's a second here. Look at verse 20 and 21. Uh, he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but endureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he's offended. It's with all the hearers what the truth of the gospel 
is declared in this stony ground hearer's ears. But unlike the wayside hearer, this one, what does he do? He hears the word in anon. And that word anon, you know what it means? It means immediately or straightway. With joy, what do they receive? They receive the word. They receive the word. In other words, they claim, they claim they believe the gospel of God's grace. They, they claim they've been justified by Christ's blood and righteousness alone. And they even continue under a true gospel ministry for a long time, most of them. But here's the problem with them. He said it, not me. Yet hath he not root in himself. That word translated root, it means the offspring of, or descendant of a person. Hear that? The offspring are the descendant of a person. What are God's elect? Who's our father? Who did we descend? Now we, we're naturally connected to Adam, but who's, whose children are we? Folks, the gospel... And Christ declared by that gospel to these people are on the life or death issue. They're not in Christ. And Christ and his truth is not in him, in them. The grace of God's not in them. And the problem is this. Well, notice what happened. They endure, endureth for a while, for when tribulation and persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by, he or she's offended. Here's the problem. When the heat of the persecution over the gospel comes and tribulation heads their way over the gospel, because, and here's how it comes, because of the word. And that word, word there, <laughs> hard to say that. that. That word translated word, you know what it is? In the beginning was the word. And the word was God. Right? So what are we talking about? We're talking about the essential word of God. Even our Lord Jesus Christ. And they're offended because of the word. Because of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says by and by he has offended. That word is offended means to put a stumbling block or impediment in the way upon which another will trip and fall. What do they do? They stumble at the stumbling stone. What's the stumbling stone? Christ alone. His blood. His righteousness alone is the only hope and cause of salvation. And see, I know that because God's word tells us that that's their case. The apostle John wrote these type of hearers. They went out from us to make manifest that they were not part of us. For if they had been of us, they would have no doubt continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that what? They might be revealed they were not part of us. He wrote in Second John verse 9, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abides, continues, remains in the doctrine of Christ he hath both the Father and the Son. Now they might continue in the visible church, but they will not and they cannot continue and abide in the truth the way our Lord Jesus Christ described his disciples abide. As he spoke these words to those that believed on him, many that had believed on him, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, you abide in my word, my doctrine, my truth. You are my disciples indeed. And you'll know the truth. And what does the truth do? It sets you free. Notice the next here is verse 22. He that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. This group of hearers are not openly profane men and women. They're not ungodly men and women. 
They're not ungodly sinners. They're not those that are unconcerned about the things of religion. These aren't men and women who persecute those who are religious. In fact, these heroes that he's writing of here and speaking of, they show not only a love for the word, but appear to have their hearts been broken by the hearing of the gospel. And their conscience is made tender because of the gospel, even reforming their lives outwardly. Outwardly, they appear to be those who receive the word of truth in good ground. And by the Holy Spirit, he's plowed the thorns underground. But in spite of all this, what happened? The cares of the world and deceitfulness of riches choked the word he becomes unfruitful. What happens to these, these people that are in the visible church, that have made a profession of religion, that claim Christ as the Lord, their righteousness? The things of time and sense are more important to them than Christ and his church. Now, don't get me wrong. True believers in this world, we are distressed by things, are we not? I never thought that I would live to see the country that I was born in come to the point where we're at today. And it's distressing. Believers are distressed by the things of time, and we are. We deal with difficulties. We have health issues. We have financial problems. We have problems in our marriages and in our lives as individuals. We just do. That's part of life. And there's a lot of believers out there that are wealthy. Abraham was wealthy, was he not? Solomon was so wealthy that when the queen of Sheba came, she, she kept quiet for a long time. She couldn't say a word. She was overwhelmed by it all. So that can't be what he's talking about. I mean, we, because we, he, in matter of fact, in the epistles, he encourages to cast all our cares, our anxieties. We are instructed to cast them where? Off of ourselves and on to him. So what, what's happened with these people? They, they've made a good profession. It reminds me of what's going on in Galatia. They're being tripped up by the things of, of time and sins. So the issue isn't merely just concern or wealth. But what we see here is that these hearers who only outwardly profess the gospel, the things of time and sense, what does it do? It chokes the word. That word choke means to choke utterly or to press round and throng one so closely as to suffocate him. What does that? Their spouses, their children, their jobs their friendship with those that are of the world, their success, their profession. All of it's more important to them, drawing them away from those means which point them to Christ who is the only true eternal riches. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 11. You know, our Lord was, he moved John to write some things that we really ought to take to heart. He said, told us through John, same John that wrote John 3, 6, he told us to do it, love not the world, neither the things that are of the world. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or pride of life, what are they? They're of the world. I love that woman to death. I love that little girl. I love my son and my daughter and all, and I love you and, as my brethren in Christ. But I tell you what, y'all, we all going away. Ain't, ain't none of us in here, other than the fact that we're in Christ, are eternal. Our, our relationships end here. At some point, you know, every one of us here are going to depart this planet unless our Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And yet we, we, we base everything on what we can feel and touch and handle and hold, don't we? And folks, this is the thing, if, if we want true comfort, and I, I'm trying to say this to myself because I'm the world's worst about it. The only real comfort we can have is in something that is eternal. Right? 
Because look, everything in this earth is going to fail you. Friendships fail you. One day, one of you, either, either the husband or wife, you're going to be left alone. It just happens. Thankfully, I can't envision. We, we lose children. We lose our wealth. Believers go to jail. Huh? Sometimes, like Joseph, not even for their own faults. But for God's purpose. Paul and Silas in prison. Right? Notice what it says here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. What did they embrace? It was not Jerusalem over there. Huh? That wasn't what they throwed their arms around and said, we, 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 we've, we've seen the end of it all. That's not it. Why? For plainly. For plainly, uh, they, they, they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of the country from whence they came out, what would they have done? If their minds was on the thing where they came from, where would they go? It would be like Lot's wife. Remember, she kept looking back. <laughs> Look back over here. But now, notice what this, now they desire a better that is a heavenly. These Old Testament saints, they desire a heavenly country wherein to God is not ashamed to be called their God. Listen to this. He hath prepared for them a city. Huh? <laughs> right, we live in Ruston, Louisiana. Oh, yeah, I stay over there. That ain't the city he's built now. Got that new couch yesterday. I love that couch. That's not where I'm intended to stay. Huh? We just, we, we, we just pass, we, we're, 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 we're sojourners. We're passing through time. Look down at verse 24. The same chapter. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, what did he do? He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. <laughs> he, had, he had risen to the point he was second in command. Only Pharaoh was over him. And he said, oh, not Pharaoh's son no more. Choosing rather to do what? To suffer with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming, look at, look at what he says. This is Moses. Esteeming the riches of Christ. This Old Testament saint, esteeming the riches of Christ greater than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. In other words, everything in this world, stack it all on one side and compare it to that which is eternal in Christ Jesus our Lord, our eternal salvation, which side of the scale slams the scale off the scale? Which one's more important? Which one's more valuable? Paul wrote this in chapter 13, verse 14. For here, listen to this, get this into your mind. For here we have no continuing city. That word continuing city, you know what it means? It means we have no city of origin down here. Do you feel that way? Are you so tied to this earth and everything that it presents in family, friends, wealth, prosperity, your children's prosperity, everything else goes out the door, you've forsaken your first love if you're a child of God. And if you're not a child of God, you're one of these thorny ground heroes that's given mental agreement to the truth, but the cares and riches of this world, what's it done? It's choked the word out. And I tell you what, all three of these hearers that we've just read about, they're all gone. In the end, because when he goes down, the next parable he talks about, what is it? It's the wheat and tares. And remember, at the end of the story, the parable of the wheat and the tares, when he explains it to them, he said that the, the men came and said, somebody sowed tares. 
Let us go in there and pull up the tares. He said, no, 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 no. Let them alone. Let them grow up together. Because in the end, who's going to sort them out? And he said, you, you go, and I, I'm not trying to pull up tares this morning. Because <laughs> the thing is, a tear and a wheat so close, we'll make a mistake. We look, we, we, even as justified saints, we get looking at the wrong things and judging based on the wrong standard. But he, he'll take care of it. He'll pluck them out. And so when it gets to the end, these three hears, the, these three hears are the ones that's in Matthew chapter 7. Lord, Lord, have we not preached in your name and done many miracles in your name, cast out demons in your name. That, that, that's, that's the ones that are in this visible church. They ain't out there in the bars. That, that, that's not your enemy. You hear me? The enemy ain't the drunk. Drunks didn't put our Lord to death. Huh? Who did? Religious people. People, how religious? Seeking to establish a righteousness. That's the ones. That, that, those are the word. Those are your enemies. Those that are going about to establish a righteousness by their doing, by their obedience, by their morality. They're our enemies. They're not your friends. Now they're not. Look at the last one. We'll quit. Ooh. <laughs> look at verse. Turn back over to look at verse twenty-three. Look at the good ground here. Notice what he says here. But he that receives seed into good ground is he that heareth the word and understands it, which also beareth fruit, bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Luke wrote it like this. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart. Let that sink in. In an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Correct understanding of, of what's meant by the good ground is essential to a correct understanding of what our Lord Jesus Christ is teaching here. Solomon asked the most important question of all. He said this, Who can say, I have made my heart clean? I am pure from my sin. Told you for years, and I will continue to harp on it as long as I'm up here as your pastor. Any question that can be answered in the positive or the negative, ask in the scriptures, how is it always answered? Negatively. So the answer to this question of Solomon, the wise Solomon, who can say I have made my heart clean? Nobody. Who can say, even you or me, who can say I am pure from my sin? By my doing. Who can answer that? Solomon also declared this, For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. And his father, King David, declared this, The fool hath said in his heart, No God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Interesting thing about that, the Apostle Paul, when he wrote Galatians chapter th Romans chapter 3 under the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit, he quoted David. As it's written, there is none good, no, not one. Who said it? King David. Not even he himself. And Job asked the ultimate question. Job asked it this way. What is man that he should be clean? All right, he which is born of a woman, that she, he should be made righteous. He also said this, how then can a man be justified with God or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? You got the answer to those questions? Huh? How can you do that? Here's a question we have to ask and we have to answer it. Since no man can make his heart clean, we've read that to you from Scripture, and since none possess an honest and good heart, like what our Lord even spoke of over there in Luke chapter 8 by nature, how can any sinner's heart be made good and honest? Able and willing to hear and receive and abide in the truth. How can that happen? Only one way. Only one way. God has to do it. God has to do it. Ran up on this scripture this week. 
I've always known it. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. How clean, Lord, from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I'll give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit. Who's doing all this? I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my judgments and you shall do them. But notice the order, please. Which comes first? Cleansing. I'll cleanse you. How does he cleanse you? Through Christ's accomplished work of redemption. Then, in time, in regeneration and conversion, by God the Holy Spirit, he brings us to faith in Christ through the preaching of God's gospel. Isn't that exactly what our Lord Jesus Christ told Nicodemus? Twice, you have to be born again. Why, you can't see the kingdom, you can't enter the kingdom. These good hearers, these good ground hearers, who are they? They're God's elect, those given to Christ in everlasting covenant of grace, redeemed and justified by his obedience unto death, and born again in time by the Holy Spirit, which always results in their hearing and their believing and their receiving and their continuance one place. Where? In Christ. Paul wrote this, Now the just, the justified, shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But thank God, listen, we are not of them that draw back to perdition. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Let me close with this this morning. All of these hearers, they all heard the same gospel message. All of them did. The difference is that God himself, what does he do? He prepares the good ground. Because you can't make it good. You can't make your heart clean. And he does it by his sovereign grace. But here's the other thing. Not only does he make the ground good, he gives you faith. Gives you and me the gift of faith. Gives us the gift of true repentance. And you know what we do? We rest in him. I'll close with this. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad. And they glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life, they believed. How many? As many as. As many as who? Were ordained, foreordained, predestinated, sovereignly chose. They and they alone believed. I tell you, if we have been given the grace of God so that we see and we hear the eternal word. It can truly be said of you and me, blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. We'll stop right there. Let's stand together and be dismissed. Lord bless you. Keep you till we see you.